We're going to have uh, some short uh, presentations from our industry leaders, um, and they're all going to answer this question, what have you learned today, and what uh, are your key takeaways from the event so far? And then I have a question for each of them. So I'm going to invite Chris to come to the podium first. And Chris, as well as answering uh, that specific uh, that general question that all of you will be answering, I wondered if you could also tell us whether or not the sector feels engaged and supported by government and others in delivering uh, the ambitions uh, that have been set out today so far. Chris. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I must say I was totally enthralled by those two previous presentations and almost forgotten what I was going to say now. Um, taking um, whatever taken away from the, the debate earlier today, I think, is, is the first question put to us. Um, I guess for me it was an interesting um, delivery from the minister, but I would say maintaining people in their own homes um, such that they can avoid expensive hospital admissions and unnecessary stays in the hospital is nothing new to us. Um, I think we all know that. Um, I certainly wasn't surprised by, by him saying that. But um, for me, you know, that what has the service achieved? Text has achieved so many people to live with confidence within their own homes, largely provided by you know, housing organisations, social care providers uh, across the UK for many years. Uh, but I think it's great that the NHS is waking up to the, uh, the real opportunity that Tex provides for them. And I think for me, the, the message that I really took away from this is, where's the new battle? Where's the new frontier? And that is moving from a reactive to a preventative agenda. And I think that's, that's where the challenge is now posed to us all, whether we be in industry, whether we be in service provision. Um, or whatever aspect of the text that we actually deliver within. So for me, that's my main takeaway. Um, I think the NHS has a, a real challenge on its hand because, for, again, taking from the Minister's uh, presentation, it looked as if they were trying to achieve that on their own within the NHS, and I think we all know it cannot be done in isolation. It does require the efforts of social care. It does require good quality housing um, that makes a difference to people's health outcomes. And we all have to work together with the appropriate technology to achieve that. So that's what I took away from the, 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 the presentation this morning. So the next question was, does industry feel supported by government? Um, I can't speak for everyone. I can only speak to someone who's been in this sector quite some time. Um, and I think rather than support, my, my description would be frustra frustration. Um, there's many points I think it would be good to cover, but we've only got a short period of time. So I've tried to, to keep it down to, to three. Um, the preventative agenda, uh, excellent, we need that. Um, we've been too much in the space of reacting to uh, incidents, issues, illnesses, exacerbations, and we need to get on the front foot, and if the NHS is to save, um, it's 22 billion. Um, we need to embrace that as, as soon as possible. But I think there was a, possibly, might, might be my, my interpretation, a little bit of a gap in terms of the logic. Um, for me, if the NHS is a service which is free at the point of use, and the, ex, the delivery of these services do, does cost money, um, is the expectation that housing and existing social care providers are to deliver and the NHS is to pick up the savings. I don't think that's fair, and we need a, 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 model, a model that works. Um, if we are to commission these services, um, for someone who spent a very short period of time in the NHS, it's a complex organisation. Commissioning is frag fragmented at best. So I, if we're looking to th for things to ask of government, maybe we ask them to consider that this is a specialist service, that the NHS commission as such, and maybe we will get to the point where GPs prescribe texts and it is free at the point of use and we all play a part in its delivery. So that was the first, first point. The second slightly different tack, um, the minister asked us to engage a digital world effectively. How can we better use data? 
And again, I think we're all prepared to do that, but let's not forget we have a largely analog estate of equipment installed out there at the moment. And for me, I think 10 years ago, probably stood here or an event like this, talking about 21CN. We were all moving from an analog to a digital infrastructure, and we all had to do that immediately. Has 21CN arrived? Maybe for some, maybe not for others. But my point being is, it's confused. It takes up effort, it takes up time, and, it uses, and it's costly. What we do require from government is a coherent strategy in terms of the infrastructure that we need to migrate from an analog world to a digital world to embrace some of the changes and the big data opportunities that were described. Surely we can't be expecting social care and housing with the budget cuts that we have at this moment in time to pick up that cost. So again, I would ask for government, maybe, the, maybe it's a point for the regulator here, to actually set out a timetable for a transition from analog to inf uh, digital infrastructure and you know, to actually describe where the funding's going to come from. Because my real fear is that people and the services might decline because we're spending money possibly in some cases unnecessary, to make that transition. So I think there's, you know, this government have to play a part in that. And point three, lastly, I absolutely agree that we need improved care pathways. Care pathways need to be responsive um, to incidents that happen in the home, but they also need to allow decisions to be made at the point at which they have maximum impact. When the paramedic is in the home, when the ward a and &E ward nurse is making the decision about whether to admit that person into hospital. When you're looking at discharge and it's four or five o'clock on a Monday night, and is it better to keep the person in or better to send them home? Those are the critical points where care pathways have to embrace techs. Techs has to play an important part in, this, in the serv service, service delivery. So again, the challenge I put back to government is We've done so much work in this space to date. There are such excellent projects which have been undertaken. Deliver service deliveries have changed such that they're actually delivering real benefits and better outcomes for patients and cost improvements. There are pockets of good practice. We actually need a coherent strategy that builds upon the past and not tries to you know, almost start all over again. Um, I'm sure industry is ready to play its part in that. Um, but it is something that requires joined up service delivery, social care, housing, health, and that's something that government has to play a part in. And my real fear is that all of this good work that we've undertaken so far ends up in a model which we see um, developed overseas and is ultimately re-imported back into the UK at a later date. That would be a real missed opportunity for the UK and everything that we've done. So I'd say, let's hold the government to account on this one and let TSA hold the government to account on this because it's so important that I don't think we can, uh, we, we can do anything other. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, thank Chris. You. And uh, now if I can invite Ali up to, uh, again, address that question about uh, what she's learned today and uh, what are her takeaways from the event so far. And then to go on to talk about and answer this question about what are, th what, uh, are the right incentives to speed up the pace of digital health uh, and tech-enabled care, uh, and indeed to inspire um, users, pa patients and carers. So what, what can be uh, the right incentives to drive this agenda forward? Okay, thank you very much for inviting me along today to speak. It's, it's a good honour. Um, I'm afraid Bailey's left us, and I was going to say she should be on the X Factor. She did a fantastic job, what a beautiful voice. And um, previously, when the Home Nations were speaking, I felt like I was on The Apprentice. So <laughs> I'm not going to say what I could have said, but there were some interesting things that are coming out this morning. Uh, I'd just like to po point out a couple of them. I think the uh, gentleman from Wales uh, made a really good point. He talked about value, so fresh thinking. Innovation is fresh thinking. That creates value. And what is that value to the, per, to the individual, to the provider? Um, in Scotland, I think they, they were talked, I think they were the only person that mentioned housing. Um, the innovation in housing, and what a sector that is. They have done great innovations with technology. Data, 
Uh, he did mention the fact that data from telecare, I believe, I think that's what he was referring to, is undervalued. Uh, think of all the valuable, rich data sets that is out there for those over 1.7 million people out there uh, who are using telecare. And how, how, what, what, how could that benefit the, the, the rest of the health and social care and indeed family members to understand what those uh, activities of daily living are perhaps and if, if you have had a fall or if you're prone to falling. There's a lot more that can be done. Um, he also mentioned the fact that they can't afford to provide technology to everybody that lives in Wales that needs it. I think he mentioned a population of three million. So how do we um, approach that subject? Uh, he mentioned the fact that we need to utilise the existing technology, the infrastructure, a lot better than we perhaps are. So those are the good things. On the negative side, it did sound to me like there was a heck of a lot of organisations out there, which I'd never heard of, um, all doing innovation and, and different things which we could all tap into. Wouldn't it be great if we just had one organisation across the UK perhaps to turn to? Um, maybe that's something that's unheard of, to have one place to go to, but I'd really like to see that. And there was a lot of talk about in 18 months' time, or we have a five-year strategy. Think about what's happening today. So, got good things and bad, that I think, that we heard from this morning. Um, it's a really important time for us. We've got the CSR, C uh, the Comprehensive Spending Review, coming along very soon. We've got the new mandate to NHS England coming along in the new year and the digital maturity roadmaps. Those are good and bad. The first time that I've seen, and I've been in this industry a long time, that the providers are actually now scoring themselves on their ability to provide, uh, they call it, remote and assistive care. So, but it's hidden among the many, many questions that if you've had a look at the Digital Maturity Index, it's hidden about uh, you know, 25 pages in. So ho hopefully that'll get through, but there's a lot of work to do because they won't know what the art of the possible is potentially. Um, two words on the NIB, the National Information Board um, initiative, which is obviously an enormous, has an enormous objective of paperless NHS and um, obviously the electronic patient record. Two bits of concern. The first one I've already mentioned, and that is about the data, the rich data set that is out there already, um, which isn't at the moment, really hasn't got a look in when they're looking at uh, combining the data for the benefit of the individual. And the second point is, uh, Chris mentioned it, the increasing replacement of analog systems with IP. This is happening all over the world. It's progressing much faster in the Nordics, Australia and Germany, etc. But it's going to come to us and we've got to be ready for it. It's going to create us a new environment for the delivery of care services. At the core of this is a world where we're working from a platform in the cloud, connecting to, managing, working out the performance of and delivering services to a multiplicity of devices in the home and outside it. So there's a lot of potential there. So we've got to keep our eyes open for this. So in response to the incentives, um, is industry provided with enough incentives? Well, I don't think it's about industry be being provided with anything. We've got to work together to get this done. Um, Multidisciplinary teams are the way forward. There are barriers in the way, which I won't go into because we won't have time, but there are three things we need to do, um, which somehow link to incentives and then a little bit of something else. The first one is we have to re-establish the case for technology-enabled care. Now, we'll have heard, uh, potentially if you, some of you will have heard what we're doing in Spain with our partners over there from their workshop this afternoon. 250,000 people we're supporting via tele, uh, teleassistance in Spain. Um, this is at scale. We know how to do scale. Northern Ireland, the, the, uh, the lady this morning didn't mention the fact that over 4,000 patients have been supported by telemonitoring over in Northern Ireland with some fantastic results. All of this stuff is happening. We need a national repository to bring it all together to work out, actually, there is enough evidence there. The second point is closer collaboration and integration. Matthew did a fantastic speech earlier um, where people are working together to provide different ways of working. And guess what? It's the private sector that's driving this change. Uh, and of course, the, the very much expertise with, from within the sector as well. We couldn't do it without each other, I guess. The other side of it is interoperability. Inter interoperability of information systems needs to happen sooner. I don't know how many out there of, of us have signed the Tech UK's interoperability charter, for example. We should all get on board with this. Nice guidance, we heard a, a talk earlier today. Um, text is being considered in home care and in social care, but it's not being considered in guidance for health because of the, they think the evidence base isn't as strong. 
And then the third thing we need is adequate funding models and appropriate commissioning. Not new funding, although it's helpful, don't get me wrong, but we can't see it as a sideline. It has to be a core enabler to change. We know the problems with budgets. 40p in every pound has been taken away from local government funding since 2010. Um, innovation is driven when there is hard times, so tight budgets do force innovation. So we need to make the most of what is out there at the moment. Uh, we don't need any more pilots. Um, we, we do need to make sure that uh, perhaps just pricing tariffs integrated in pool budgets would also help. So I think I should finish there. Tight bud budgets, as I've said, do force innovation, but we have to support the champions. They're in a de massively demanding uh, position in health, social care and housing. We've got to free them up to enable them to innovate and to spread good practice. And we, yes, we talked about integration, but there is a lot happening out there. We've got to support individuals out there to do it at scale. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. Can I invite uh, Paul to the podium, um, and uh, as well as answering the, the general question about the takeaways for today, um, I just wanted to uh, ask you to sort of cast back five years and, and look at where we were then and now look at the landscape today. Um, is it a better place today than it was five years ago in terms of the opportunities for tech? Okay, thank you, Paul. Five years, that seems a long time ago. I'm not sure I remember last year, let alone five years ago. I think um, what I've learned from today, uh, I was very interested in George Freeman's statement about moving from healthcare to health and well-being. I strongly agree with that, uh, that plan. I also was quite impressed with his acceptance of his mission, which is policies to accelerate the uptake of innovation in the NHS. Good luck, good luck with that one, George. I think he's going to need a bit of help from the industry here, perhaps. Uh, my favorite statement from today was actually from Ivan Evans um, about creating value and getting it done, and also proving that it was worth doing. I thought that was a very worthy statement. Uh, time is muscle also sticks in my mind for some reason, Paul, so thanks for that one this morning. Um, what I would observe is that I've been in this industry for 21 years now, um, and what I've found from probably the last 15 is I've seen that technology always seems to be moving faster than our ability to actually apply it and use it. And that's a, a catch-up which I don't think we'll ever, ever win. So in terms of five years ago, are we any further forward? Um, I think that's a mixed, a mixed result, really. I think the challenges are greater. We have the increasing elderly population. We have reduced budgets. But at the same time, I think the appetite for change I'm seeing is much more there now than it was five years ago, which is a good thing. I also see the TSA making excellent progress. I think they're engaging at a higher level. Um, the example of George Freeman's speech this morning was good, although it would be great to have him here in person this next year. And also the fact of uh, bringing the four nations together. Um, the, the talks that are going on there is really the first time I've seen more of a unified approach to this, the challenges of our elderly population. And at the same time, I think the thing that we really need to do is to change the culture. And one powerful way to do that is to really help people at all levels of health and care and housing and social care to be able to see the benefits not just for their patients and the people that they care for, but the benefits for themselves in their everyday lives, in their everyday doing their jobs. And I think that's a really key thing we need to, to work on together. And at the same time, I applaud George's statement about information in the hands of patients or people, but I think that also needs to extend to carers and next of kin and into the hands of professionals. He mentioned that the data is, is being used by professionals, but actually there's a lot of data in telecare monitoring centers which never goes beyond the center. And I think Alistair actually mentioned that in his speech this morning. I applaud the focus on health, but actually let's not forget social care and housing. I think we need a holistic approach if we're really going to solve problems in this, in this country. Most importantly, I've heard lots about what and the why and the who. I think we know those answers to those questions. I think what we're not getting is to the how. I think the how is the most important thing here and it's, it's the most difficult thing to achieve. And that's where I would like to see the focus over the coming 12 months about how we actually do this. And some ideas of round table discussions in, in Parliament, cross-party discussions. Could we in some way decouple the, the politics from what we know needs to be done on the ground? 
And there are simple things, I think, that could ra rapidly improve the way things work here in the UK. Procurement, I think, is a huge obstacle uh, and preventing innovation from being deployed. So overall, I have to say I'm enjoying this conference, and uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. And we're all pleased you're enjoying the conference. Thank you very much. Um, our next contributor is Phil. Um, and uh, I'd like to invite Phil to not just respond to the uh, takeaways that uh, he, he's had from so far today, but also to look at the policy debate that we had this morning um, and, and the uh, sessions we've had since, in fact. Really, what do you think the TSA should be doing to follow up on those debates, really to inspire the uh, progress and change that's now needed? Thank you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, what I take away, I see this, lots of good people, lots of very good ideas. Uh, I think there's a lot of concern over projected spending cuts, and the motto of more for less will be heard now and in the future. Technology will be a big part of enabling them more for less, uh, but where we come from, uh, I think, we should first look at, go back to basics, make it work. I think earlier Paul uh, used the phrase, he quoted, culture eats strategy for breakfast. We would say connectivity eats strategy for breakfast. If you cannot connect to the, advice, to the device in the premises, doesn't matter how good your strategy is, it won't work. We've been doing something called critical connectivity uh, for 20 years now. We've been working with health for six. Uh, we were operate in sectors like fire, security, and obviously the health sector. We help our manufacturing partners uh, make their product work better, make it communicate better. And we work in something called the last mile. And that's where the device needs to contact something in order to transmit some data. We, we provide roaming sims, we actually give away all of our uh, firmware to our manufacturing partners, because that's the way progress works. Give the good stuff away, then you'll get a better result. We'll also let them pull, so you get more integrity in the products, and therefore, if the products are better, people will use them more, and you will get more benefits from them. To move forward into the world of more for less, we have to embrace the world of IoT, uh, the Internet of Things. You heard it mentioned earlier with Bailey. Uh, everybody's heard of it. Most people are a little bit afraid of it. Uh, there's some very long, complicated definitions about what it is. But in reality, it allows people or organizations to do the things they do better, normally or cost-effectively, you can make better decisions because you have more information. Do I need to make a visit? Can I make a more informed visit? Can I make a more timely visit? I'll give you two examples of how IoT can work. In our company, we moved from IoT to an IoT model some four years ago. Uh, we used to sell products. Our goal was to sell more products. We now sell services. Our goal is to sell better services. So you move from more to better. Another example, a TSA member, Apollo, uh, came to see us. They had a problem. Uh, carers were arriving at their warden call schemes, and they had to get access by putting a call into the, res to the response center. This tied up the person in the response center, delayed the care, and reduce the amount of time, the time, care time available. We work with Apollo and commission smart access. Uh, it's a system, uh, the, the care has an app, they arrive at the premises, they put in their code, uh, the smart access verifies and validates who they are, opens the door, lets them in. So you have more time with care, you have a better utilization of resource, and someone in the response center is doing what they should do, which is responding to critical calls. IoT may be the method of delivery. However, the real progress will come from the ideas 
that come from the people in this room and at this conference. What can we do tomorrow better than we do today? Again, in our world, in that last model, and Chris talked about it, we need to move from analog to digital. PS, the enter the telephone line, worked well in the past. However, it will not facilitate the IoT world where data is required in the future. It has to be mobile or IP. Uh, I think, again, Chris talked about government's response in Sweden. Uh, they are switching all the analog devices. They're switching them all to digital. It all has to be done within a framework agreement. It all has to be done by the end of 2017. We know we supply roughly half of the, uh, the connectivity to half the products. It hasn't been easy, but the outcomes are excellent. So I would say embrace IoT in all its aspects. Uh, there's people, talk to our people, talk to people who know about it. Do not be afraid of it. Uh, we understand IoT, we understand the health. There's other people, Mobius, I think, is out here, Doug and his team. Talk to them. Talk to as many people as you can. Get good advice. If we have an external message from ourselves to give to the TSA, to the TSA to give to government, uh, it will be something along the lines of what George Friedman had said earlier, for those of you that here. He said 60% of the older population uses a smartphone. Only 2% access the NHS, which is obviously bad. I would say, try getting a signal sometimes, George. We live in a first world company with a third world mobile network infrastructure. If we are to generate more for less, with IoT, we need the tools that allow us to do it, which is a first-rate 4G mobile network. We need it, and we need it now. We can make it work, and we do, but we'd like to focus our resource on making it work better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. And finally, uh, can I invite Andrew to the podium? Um, and um, again, to address that uh, general question that all our panelists have been kindly answering, and, and then to say something about what your hopes are for the spending review, perhaps also what your fears might be for the spending review, um, and then how um, the TSA should take uh, what, it's, what it's hearing here today and presumably tomorrow as well uh, to shape its policy direction and messages to government. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to try and answer the same question as everybody else, try and uh, see if I can pull some themes out. For me, um, there is clearly a crisis of funding, and therefore um, the spending review that we're going to get in a few weeks' time is going to be very important to us. Um, so everyone is very clear, everyone in health and social is care is very clear, there is a shortage of money. I then walked around the stands downstairs, and what is very clear is there is an awful lot of innovation. There is an awful lot of great work going on, services and technologies that could actually save money. And yet the cry from so many people was, well, we, yeah, it's great, but we're not selling as many as we could. We don't get the take up. And many of them had fantastic benefits for the technologies they had. And then we heard this morning from the... Uh, four countries, and we also heard from George Freeman. George Freeman said, show me the benefits, um, make it nice and simple, don't use clever technology. And then the people from the four countries said, show me the benefits, don't use clever technology. And I thought to myself, well, downstairs, people are showing me the benefits, and they're using simple technology. So I sort of couldn't quite tie the two together. And I was sitting there in one of the presentations feeling very frustrated that we've got all of this stuff and we're all, we are all frustrated because the thing just isn't moving as fast as it should. Um, I then had the um, privilege of going down and, and presenting um, uh, or chairing a session from uh, some colleagues in Spain. And it made me think of, um, and I'll explain what they talked about, but. How many of you were around when the PC came in? I can't really see, but put your hand up if you remember the PC being introduced. I do, so I'm putting my hand up. The PC, when the PC came in, there was a thing called the killer app. And lots of people now are often talking about you know, the killer app. We all want the killer app because that will change the world. 
And I think, you know, the politicians were asking for the killer app from us. George Freeman wants the killer app or a few killer apps. The killer app for the PC when it came in was a thing called SuperCal, which was basically an Excel spreadsheet. And, it, and the, the PC needed something which meant everybody would go and use it. And it, it was an Excel spreadsheet. I mean, uh, Microsoft then introduced Excel, but there was a thing called SuperCal which came out. And when we had the spreadsheet, everybody started using PCs. They, they spread like wildfire. No one actually worked out how many hours it saved by using a spreadsheet. I never saw one benefits realization for a spreadsheet. I guess there may have been one. Um, email was another one. That was a sort of uh, a, a killer, killer app. No one ever did a benefits realization. When I went down and, and heard the um, Spanish people talking, Esther and Luis, about what they're doing in Catalonia, they have got a system there whereby social care, health care, primary and secondary are all talking together. They have a system that works. Unfortunately, at the moment in the UK, I think we have a system, particularly in England, where there are perverse incentives. We don't have the basis of a system where we're working together to find solutions to the problems, and we don't have an integrated health and care record. I think the PC that we need, on which George and people could put their um, killer apps, is a system that is collaborative, health, social care, talking together, hospitals not worrying about the perverse incentives of activity. If we had that basis of a good system, it doesn't need to be an accountable care organisation, but maybe that would be good. We need a system with the appropriate IT in place, with a, you know, a single healthcare record that we can all get access to. The great news is NHS England, I think, are pressing forward with that, so we should get that. But let's, let's all work locally in our systems to get the basis. And then when we've got the basis of that, innovation will come through. Because it was interesting, Lewis and Esther loved all the stands down. So they thought it's fantastic, the innovation, because they can take that innovation back. They've got a system that will accept innovation. So um, that is my sort of takeaway and um, learning from today. Let's um, wait for the spending review. But if the spending review doesn't give us what we want, which I'm not sure it will, maybe that will be the burning platform which will make us change and work collaboratively. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've heard some industry response and um, we're carrying on the conversation now through various other discussions during the course of the rest of the day and into next uh, day. But I want to just show our appreciation again to our industry contributors and uh, we'll be inviting up the next speaker in a moment. Thank you very much.